Thank All you. right. I have one more question. My daughter, um, okay. Grandpa passed away oh, no. last week. Oh. Okay. I didn't know it until I opened up the paper. <laughs> oh, okay. So sympathies for faith family. All right, so today we get to uh, jump into uh, uh, Revelation chapter 7. Uh, and uh, as we uh, prepare to jump into <laughs> chapter 7, I've got a little bit of an intro that I uh, put out in the, I think I included it on the study guide as well. Um, so I'll just kind of share this and then we'll read the chapter. Uh, chapter 7 presents us with the four winds being held back until those who worship God uh, rather than the beast are sealed. While there's debate over the particulars, and this is something we need to keep in mind as we uh, study the book of Revelation, right? There's debate among the particulars, like who are the 144,000, why this listing of the tribes, how do the 144,000 relate to the great multitude, the timing of the tribulation, how the seals and the trumpets and the bulls all relate to one another, etc. right? Those would be some of the particulars. The overall picture is that those who are saved are protected from God's wrath, uh, but not immune to persecution and death in this world. The sealing of the 144,000 from every tribe provides assurance of belonging to God and his protection. The great multitude from every nation, uh, which is where verse 9 picks up, uh, before, uh, the great multitude before the throne who had come um, out of the tribulation shows that God's people now are composed of saved Jews and saved Gentiles, who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, Stuart writes, and I quote, Revelation celebrates and anticipates the salvation of Israel, a salvation to which Gentiles were being welcomed to join through submission and allegiance to Israel's Messiah, Jesus. This understanding of the inclusion of Gentiles in Israel's restoration and revelation reflects the broad approach of early Christianity and is not supersessionistic although supersessionistic ideas are evident from the second century onward. Uh, supersessionistic is basically the, the church replacing Israel, uh, in case you want to know what the term means. Thanks for reading my mind. You're, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, in chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, the seer remains deliberately in the Jewish milieu so that the readers associate automatically with the eschatologically renewed Israel and from here, they are led to the understanding developed in verses 9 through 17 that with this Israel, there are also Gentiles. Uh, that's where verse 9 picks up. So we have the tribes in the first verses and then the great multitude uh, after that. By leading the readers in this way, the author attains the following. One, he adheres to a priority of the salvation history of the Jewish people and differentiates between Israel and the Gentiles by letting the movement flow in a biblical manner from Israel to the Gentiles. Two, he emphasizes that the true Israel is the Israel that found its completion in Christ, reckoned here as the Jewish Israel believing in Jesus. And three, this Israel in return has opened itself to the Gentiles, and they belong now in the soteriological sense, uh, or salvation sense, entirely to it. But from the viewpoint of history and salvation, they are being added. So you have believing Jews plus uh, verse 9 brings in uh, believing Gentiles, end quote. Uh, well, end quote before that last part in the commentary. Uh, likewise, the vision of the multitude before the throne who have come out of the tribulation is to encourage believers in the present time of tribulation to persevere and overcome. A lesson that we can still use today, right, in our own situations. Reiterating the promise to those who overcome and conquer with the seven churches from Revelation 2 and 3. The description of their status in chapter 7, verses 15 through 17, aligns with the new heavens and the new earth of Revelation 21, except for here they are serving in the temple. And we'll note that by the time we get to Revelation 21, if we make it to Revelation 21, uh, there is no temple. Uh, so this is another place where you get some debate over the particulars because their status is described in the same way in chapter 7 as in chapter 21, but there's a slight difference, and the difference is there's uh, a temple here, but not there. Uh, so this leads people to debate whether it's picturing the intermediate state and awaiting God's full vindication uh, uh, on the way to the new heavens and the new earth. That's some of the particulars that they get uh, debating over. 
So let's uh, dive into uh, Revelation chapter 7, and it may not surprise you, but we'll quickly find ourselves in the Old Testament again as well. Yes, Wayne? Uh, A.E. Stewart, what, where is he from? What's his, is he a new guy, old guy, been around a long time? You know, I don't know. Because I find something ironic in his use of words. Uh -huh. If you read anything about Islam, Islam says you must submit and uh, declare allegiance to Islam. In that wording, I mean, I know I'm probably being too sensitive, but I find fault with that wording. About I don't submit to, the to Jesus. I accept him as my savior. In Islam, you submit to Muhammad, his teachings, and everything that Islam says, because that's what Islam means, submission. So, so, it's, too. so while, while it's true, uh, what's the difference between accepting Jesus as Lord and, uh, I mean, as Savior and Lord? What would be the difference between those two? In my mind, see, that's the problem. In my mind, that's totally different than submitting to a philosophy. If, if I call Jesus Lord, I'm submitting to him. I own. Yeah. I get you, but it just mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of um, slave um, imagery throughout scriptures, mm -hmm. even more so in the New Testament. I mean, Paul opens up and says this in several books, a slave to Christ. Um, I will not argue with you. Islam has, and excuse my French, bastardized what submission means. Um, Remember, Robbie Zacharias was talking to the um, third most powerful man in Islam, and he claimed that it was the um, fastest growing religion on the planet. And Zacharias immediately responded, what if you take your boot off their necks? Mm -hmm. So that's the, yeah. that's the point about it. There's a difference between willful submission and there's a difference between um, forced submission. And I willfully submit to Christ, and I willfully submit to what um, I learn about him, what he would have me do. But then I also go back to what Mr. Heiser says. That which cannot be obtained by moral perfection cannot be lost by moral imperfection. And that's my only hope. Because trust me, I am morally imperfect. Uh, yeah, and, and when you think about it, I mean, submission is what Jesus is calling for when he says, to follow me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow. I mean, uh, I mean, that's exactly what he's calling for disciples is to submit to him. I, don't, I, don't I think, think he answered my question. It's a will for submission. Yes. Mm -hmm. In okay. Islam, it's you get a choice. You submit to him right. or we'll kill you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and don't, and don't think it wasn't on purpose that yeah. Islam ruined the meaning of that because yeah. Satan works through all of this stuff. We see it with language all the time. Um, I remember when it, when I would have been mm -hmm. proud to have a rainbow on my car. Now I have to have, you know, uh, I've got uh, if I put a rainbow on my car, I have a car. I have to have a a document attached explaining what I mean. We just put an arc. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, but, about but it. along that lines, if bottom line is, and what Jesus said, either you're a slave to him or you're a slave to Satan. Yeah, or Satan, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is the language of the New Testament. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. there's um all of the slave terminology in the New Testament is there's a sense of it. I read this somewhere, um, something I'm studying this week. Um that there's a difference between the idea of slavery as in you have to be here, you're here to serve, you know, you've been taken captive, you're forced to serve in somebody's house, whether you like it or not. There's a difference between that and the New Testament idea, their idea is a bond servant. Um, there could be bond servants in that time too. Mm -hmm. It's um, someone who was a, a slave, liked their master so well, that they wanted to stay there forever. They put a hole through their ear um, with an awl 
Yeah. yeah. And they were there for life. That actually and goes back to the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, that actually goes back to the Old Testament. The, the, the slaves were set free after seven years unless they chose to remain permanent because they had because he wanted to slave to Christ because he gave everything for us. Like, mm -hmm. he didn't want to give everything to him. Entirely different. Yeah, exactly. One, one more thought. And I just I found it really interesting when I was studying about reading a book about worship because the word worship means bow down or to be prostrate before the um, and And to be submissive toward someone and the other thing that pointed out in that same study was that all throughout the old testament god calls the israelites a stiff-necked people which means they are unwilling to bow no. to bend the neck to bend the neck so and that was common word yeah yeah it's a beautiful, a beautiful picture too yeah i mean in terms of how graphical language goes. Yes. Not not beautiful that they were stiff necked. How's that Stuart called black Uh S T E W A R T. A A E. Like mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, honestly, it's just one more book that I picked up. It's a fairly new commentary. Okay. Uh, yeah. and uh he's got some good points he's made so far, but uh Dan doesn't have wisdom to know when enough is enough, and he keeps reading and diving into more fear and there. <laughs> well, I just wanted to make it clear. I appreciate Rich's explanation, so I can forgive him for using the word. <laughs> All right. Perfect. All right. Uh, anybody want to read uh, Revelation chapter 7 for us? All right. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. And from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the corner of the throne will be their shepherd. 
He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. All right. Thank you. Amen. So as we uh, went through chapter six, we got through the first six seals, and then we kind of open up chapter seven with this picture of four angels standing at the four corners, holding back the four winds. So we're going to look back to Jeremiah 49, 34 through 39, to get a picture of what do the winds represent. Yeah, that's in the Old Testament. That's in the Old Testament. Yeah, because, uh, you know, as we pointed out from the start, Revelation is heavily dependent on language and imagery from the Old Testament. You know, Jeremiah puts a, a nice little caveat on it. It helps, it helps me understand. Uh, 49 verses 34 through 39. I got it. Yeah. All right. That which came as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet concerning Elon at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah the king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am going to break the bow of Elon, the finest of the might. I will bring upon Elon the four winds from the four ends of the earth, and will scatter them to all these winds, and there will be no nation to which the outcasts of Elon will not go. So I will shatter Elon before their enemies. And before those who seek their lives, I will bring calamity upon them with even my fierce anger, declares the Lord. And I will send out the sword after them until I have consumed them. Then I will set my throne in Elam and destroy out of it the king and princess, declares the Lord. But it will come about in the last days I will restore the fortunes of Elam, declares the Lord. All right. So what do the four winds represent? Another form of punishment? Judgment, yeah, punishment. So kind of sounds similar to what we talked about last week with four horsemen, right? And we connected that with Zechariah. Uh, so you're kind of seeing this theme. And, and sometimes, you know, um, sometimes you can say the same thing, but you can say it in different words and different imagery and, and in a different way. You see God waiting, continuously waiting. So what's the purpose of the four angels holding back the four winds? He's been waiting for the, the, the rest of Elam and the rest of to come to him. Well, it's, well, as we come to Revelation, it's about sealing his people. Yeah, sealing his people. Right? So so chapter 6 has brought us through six seals with judgment falling upon the kings and all the way down to slaves, leaving the question at the end of chapter 6, well, who then can stand? <laughs> chapter 7 is going to start answering that question because it sets in contrast between those who are under God's judgment, chapter 6, with those who are under God's protection, chapter 7. Holding back the winds denotes that judgment is being held back until God seals his servants so that they're protected. It's interesting you use the Elam, because Elam can re represent Israel, but it also represents the countries that fall, because he was the son of Shem, which Israel was under, but there's other countries that would have fallen under that too. Oh, well, we don't need to look at the judgment from Jeremiah. We just need the idea of how he's using the language of four winds. Oh, okay. Right, because he, that's that's irrelevant for Revelation. Re Revelation is drawing the imagery of the four winds and holding back the four winds to depict what's going on here. Uh, okay. He's just kind of echoing the same kind of language from Jeremiah. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, uh, did you have some background on Stuart? Did you find some background on? No. What's the title of that book? Uh, Revelation. Reading Revelation. Uh, I think I might have found it. Okay, well, if you did, I did not. Really... It's, it's a, a 2024 a revelation. It just came out by A.J. Kostenberger and Yarborough from B&H Academic. Oh, so that's a quote within that book. He's not the author of that book? No, he is the, uh, it's a commentary that he just came out with. Well, there's an Alexander East word from Gateway Seminary, which sounds very, very biblically grounded. Oh yeah, yeah, it's been it's been very he goes through very biblically arguments. Yeah. Alexander E, you said? Yeah, Alexander E. Stewart, he's like the vice president <laughs> uh, uh, of Gateway Seminary. Vice President of Academic Services and Professor of New Testament. Okay. Interests are ancient Greek rhetoric of pocketism. 
Sounds like the right word. guy. <laughs> Book of Revelation. Yeah, sounds like the right guy. Yeah. Uh, so we do see parallels with the angels in the four corners that also come from Zechariah 6. Uh, so we're seeing this identity. We're kind of seeing a similar identification between the four horsemen and the four winds, this idea of judgments coming through those. Uh, and so the picture that's kind of being painted for us as we come into chapter seven is we're being introduced to this judgment that's going to come through the four horsemen and the, and the seals. And, and we come to chapter seven and, you know, it's like, People are starting to shake in their boots because they see the election come. Oh, I mean, because they see these things coming up, and God says, "Now, let's hold back the judgment until my people are sealed." Right. So the picture is God sealing His people before the judgment comes. God's people are coming under His protection before it comes. So only the Jews are saved, or the Israelites are saved, based on the tribes. <laughs> oh, you got to start that. So there, there's, there's where you'll get into some of the uh, particulars, right? And, and and what and the big picture right and, and so and how do verses uh, one through was it eight relate to verses uh, where nine, nine starts with the great multitude? Uh, but what we do see in the big picture is the angels are holding back the judgment until the servants are sealed, which uh, sealing would indicate what kind of thoughts come to mind with the sealing? It's a, it's a mark or a symbol, like a king's signet ring in wax. Yeah. You know, something like that, that you can look and, and know that they are of the king. That it's authentic, that right. it's genuine, that it's real, uh, official. it's official. Mm -hmm. uh, you have ideas of, of ownership and authority, uh, right? So this is this is God's way of saying, you belong to me. Right. Isn't that what the purpose, one of the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to seal us? There is a seal. Yeah. Uh, yes, and we're gonna we're gonna look at a few verses here in just a minute about how the language of sealing also takes place in the New Testament. So th that's a it's a very good point because when we talk about uh, God sealing His people, we're not talking about well, let's take a pen of permanent marker and write it across their foreheads, right? Likewise, when we talk about taking the mark of the beast, you know, it's not necessarily a visible mark. There is this idea of sealing by the Holy Spirit that, that we're going to find in the New Testament. Yeah. It's the mark on our hearts. Mm -hmm. Not that you should ever go to Saturday Night Live for your eschatology. But, uh, <laughs> oh right. One of my favorite ones is John Belushi was on there and they were doing a parody of the Omen. And they said, quick, check his forehead, see if it's marked. Well, she went behind him and pulled up his, his hair. She says, Oh, good. It's 999. <laughs> I've, I've always found that so very funny because Belushi's looking like he is possessed, which he probably was. But um, the, thing I, the thing I find so funny about that is we think we know what we're looking for, but we yeah. need to come at it from the right perspective. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, since the 70s, I have heard so much about the 144,000. Yeah. It's no longer my favorite number. Right. I'll tell you uh, that right yeah. now. Well, yeah. the, the thing is, <laughs> what it's on its head is starting in verse 9. When well, so so we also student. we also see in Revelation 14 where God's writing his name on their foreheads, right? right? But like I said, that needs to be understood figuratively and symbolically. You know, it's it's not taking a permanent marker and writing on the forehead. Yeah, I always got hung up on, not hung up on, I always had an answer for the Jehovah Witnesses. Yeah. And I'd say, now look, if you're out here beating on doors, there's only going to be 144,000 of you people up in heaven. Aren't you afraid you're just going to find somebody and they're going to believe you and follow you and now all of a sudden you're not one of the 144,000? <laughs> and I brought that to pastor's attention, and he said, oh, oh, but let me back up. The first Jehovah Witness I had contact with had a King James Bible, and he sat down, and we were talking about a specific verse. He knew the verse better than I did. But as he opened his Bible to look for that verse, and he got to the page, I look at it, and there's, it's like a redacted government document. All blacked out all the oh. way through it. So, uh, 
a pastor explained to me that the Jehovah Witnesses got hung up on the 144,000, probably have the same kind of questions. And then all of a sudden they said, well, you know, it's 144,000 plus a chosen few. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so the big the big picture is we're seeing a contrast between those sealed by God and those who will take the mark of the beast. I yep. mean, that, that's the, the yes. big picture. Belong to God or belong to the beast. And the number is irrelevant. Now, now, uh, well, when you get uh, one, the number is symbolic, right? You're talking perfectly rounded numbers, perfectly from every tribe. So that should give us a clue that the number is symbolic and the number is symbolic of completion, right? So the idea is, hey, you know what? If you belong to God, God knows it. Amen. Right. God's not going to miss you. You're not going to fall through the cracks. If you belong to God, uh, God knows it. A day in your court is better than a thousand, not a thousand and one, not 999, a thousand elsewhere. We get really hung up on the numerical values that are given. And yet we have no problem saying, you know, I must have told you a million times to stop bringing up the 144,000. Exactly. You know, we have no problem with that. But boy, as soon as you see a number in scripture, it's accurate to 17 decimal places. Yeah. And, and it's the same with uh, uh, the God belong to cattle on a thousand hills. Yes. Does not, that mean, not, that, not, does not, that mean not, the cattle on the thousand of first hill doesn't belong to God? Yeah. Right. Uh, so, so, I, so I mean, the the uh, uh, the way it's presented is to give us a clue that he's he's speaking of a completeness of the people of God, right? Um, and, and not exactly 144,000. I I remember because I think with the Jehovah's Witness they used to teach uh, the 144,000 was you know just for the saved, right? And yeah. you know, never mind that we're talking the tribes here. Right. Never mind that we're talking in trash yeah. which the Jehovah's didn't belong to. But the other piece of that was was when their numbers exceeded 144,000, they changed what they taught. Yeah. So then it was not 144,000 saved, but 144,000 who will be in heaven and the rest will be on the new earth. So their theology changed when their theology no longer fit with the practicality. Their prophecy changed because they. That was their big prophecy, and that started at the turn of the last century, that he was saying 144,000. And as my mother used to point out, you can't believe their initial prophecy. Why are you signing on <laughs> yeah. for the next one? You know, so far, they're 0 and 1. Yeah. Okay, why are you sign? you know, why are you going with that guy? Yeah. You know, I understand horsemen you know, and the punishment you can get just because Kelly kind of explained to you what happens when a horse runs over you. Painful. <laughs> but, you know, you think about the winds. People don't think of the winds as destructive, but they're a super destructive force. Oh, yeah. And in, 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 in my lifetime, and I, I attribute it to better press coverage, but I have heard about more and more hurricanes, more and more tornadoes, I went to Florida when I was a teenager and I was shocked at my aunt's and my cousin's house. I called it the fortress. <laughs> it was made out of concrete blocks, had a flat roof with an 18 inch parapet with, with scuppers six inches up. And there were steel shutters all the way around the house and steel <laughs> shutters for the doors. And I'm thinking, what is this? And my cousin, who I doubt had ever been through a hurricane, Donnie says, have you ever been through a hurricane? No. So I didn't understand the force of the wind. Oh, yeah. My my mom was in the F5 tornado that hit Parsons. Yep. Let me tell you somebody who can tell you about oh, the force of the wind. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You don't appreciate it until you see it. Mm -hmm. So... What are they being protected from? And and, and uh, we've kind of already put on this, but I, we need to understand what it says and what it doesn't say. What are they being protected from? Well, the judge, the overall judgment, or but they're not protected from um, going through suffering. They're being protected from the judgment of God, but not from suffering. Oh, yeah. Right, and this is why I we need to. So if you, it, now when we get down to the great multitude, where did the great multitude come out of? The tribulation. 
What are the churches going through? Tribulation. What does John say he's a brother and partaker in? The, the tribulation. tribulation. Right? Now, I emphasize this point because they're being sealed and protected by God, but we're going to have two witnesses that are going to be martyred. We have Antipas, Antipas which, who is martyred, right? So we need to understand what God's promising and what he's not promising. He's promising you're protected from my judgment. He's not promising we're protected from the persecution of the world. And how is that different than our faith today? It's not. It's the same. <laughs> exactly. Same. Now, uh, this, this is a, this is like a very short explanation of what Christianity is. You're protected from eternal judgment, but you don't get out of this life alive. Yeah, exactly. That's a good way to put it. You don't get out of this life alive. All right. Uh, now, if you read through, uh, you know, a resource or two or three or four hundred. <laughs> You're going to lay out, you're going to see people lay out all sorts of options, including uh, physical harm. I'm like, but that's not what he's teaching. Are there still to be excluded from physical harm? Uh, well, yes, yes. Uh, so you'll also get the ideas that they're protected from the demons from chapter nine. Now that one, uh, that one we can say because God says, hey, you have permission except for the ones who are sealed. Uh, so uh, other theories that have been posed is uh, they're protected from losing their faith and hence their salvation. Uh, they're protected from the wrath of God coming upon the world. Um, like I said, I only I, I, I wanted to emphasize that because uh, tribulation in this world, you're going to have tribulation. And if we if we misunderstand what God promises, uh, then we're going to have uh, misunderstandings of what to expect in the midst of life. Now, Don made a comment earlier about this idea of sealing. So let's look at how the uh, New Testament uses the language of sealing. Uh, so we got uh, first, 2 Corinthians 1, 20 through 22, and Ephesians, and a, two passages from Ephesians. So somebody want to read for us 2 Corinthians 1, 20 through 22? Oh, that's in the New Testament. Okay. One, twenty uh, 22. I got it. Okay. For all the promises of God are yes in Christ, and so through him our amen is spoken to the hand of God. Now it is God who establishes both us and you in Christ. He anointed us, placed his seal on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a pledge of what is to come. All right, so think about how beautiful this is. All of God's promises. What promises is he referring to? Eternal life. And all the Old Testament promises. Right? All these Old Testament promises, all these prophecies, they find their yes and their amen in Christ. Right? He is the fulfillment. And we see this language of sealing and him being given as a guarantee. How about Ephesians 1, 13 and 14? Anybody have that? All right, Wayne. All right. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of the Lord. <laughs> All right, so once again, we have sealing through the Holy Spirit, which occurs when? Salvation. Upon your salvation. Upon your salvation, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel. Now, is that true for both Jew and Gentile? No. Yes. In fact, uh, uh, in chapter 2, he's going to talk about how God makes two people, or two people into one people. Those who are near and those who are far. That would be uh, chapter 2, verses 11 through uh, 22 and uh, Ephesians 4 30. I got it. All right. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. All right. So that kind of gives us a picture of the language of sealing. Were you getting ready to say something? No. All right. So we see this picture of sealing as depicting salvation and our guarantee of a future inheritance. Right. 
because we're protected from the eternal judgment. Yeah. We're not getting out of this life alive, but we have something better that awaits us. Maybe if you had a little more faith. Yeah, exactly. Maybe you had a little more faith. Well, I made it to a thousand today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and you said you're talking about a list of what we're protected from, and you said something about that we're protected from I don't know, disbelief or something. I can't remember. Oh, uh, one of one of them was from losing their faith, right? And it's something. That's something that I'm, I guess, worried about because if I feel like there's persecution coming, so I'm thinking, okay, this could get bad. It could get ugly. We could be. I mean, what if we're being tormented, tortured, or something? If I if I'm being tortured, I'm going to try my best to not give in and not, you know, renege against my faith. Well, what if I'm too much of a weenie and I do? You know, what what happens? I mean, if I, isn't that denying God, you know, if I, you know what, are you, you understand what I'm saying? You know. How do I know that? Most of us have probably had the experience where uh, you've walked alongside a, a friend or a family member and they've been going through something very hard and, and struggling through it. And you sit back and you think, boy, I just don't know if I could do that if I was in their shoes. Yeah. Well, you know, the truth of the matter is uh, they didn't know that they wouldn't have thought they could have either. Uh, God can give us strength that we don't realize that we have. And I think it's, this kind of comes back to uh, in the prayers, right, about Where's my my trust, or, uh, and that trust that, that God can sustain us even as He saves us? I think we can get into uh, playing the the what ifs, and we do a lot of harm to ourselves because you know we don't really know those answers. Uh, we're just called to trust Him today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the other thing is is okay. You're ta you're taking it to an extreme, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But again. <laughs> Speaking in pure Christian terms, what's the difference between that and you're given an opportunity to witness someone and you drop the ball when you're not being persecuted? Mm -hmm. But maybe you're, you know, in Walmart and there's a bunch of people standing around and you have a chance to step up and witness and you drop the ball. I feel like being disciplined by mom and dad only is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we have to... We have to watch taking so strong is the, only the spirit you need to raise your hand. from, you know, the literal meaning. Like when God says, yeah. if you deny me before men, that's, or Jesus says that, that's, 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 that is that's primarily right. in how you live. Okay? It's more long term. It, it, right. Very good point. Yeah. God plays the long term okay. game. Okay. And again, I go back to if you live out the law perfectly, was the law given to us for salvation? No, it never was. That was never the intent of the law. So if you can, if you can step up and handle, um, have an answer for every question thrown at you, and yet in your heart you have not accepted Christ, huh? You, you may have a better, slightly better spot in hell than the next guy. But if, what it boils down to is the commitment of your heart. And God understands that. Mm -hmm. Joretta has um, a cousin, and he stood up in my wedding, Kevin. And he's, I'm going to be very politically incorrect. He's mentally retarded. Very sharp kid for the shape that he's in. And he does a lot with the local church. Is God going to judge him the same as he judges me? No. Mm -mm. And I go back, and I, I believe it's Joseph that says, well, not the God of the universe do what is right. And, and whenever I have questions about eternal salvation, eternal judgment, eternal damnation, I go back to the point of, will not the God of the universe do what's right? 
I am not in a caravan that says, <clears throat> you know what, the Dinka tribesmen that never heard about Christ, they're all going to hell. I'm sorry, I'm not in that, I'm not in that bus. Because they're going to be judged differently than you and me that have heard. And then the question comes, what are we going to do? And that's why, you know, we can take these extremes and we can we can worry about them. And, you know, I'm not saying that's wrong, but now all of a sudden you've come down to a performance-based phase. God, you're on, you're on the rack being stretched. And God says, you know, if that goes one more crank and you deny me, you're out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think the, the difference between the moment and a, a habit or a yes. practice is, is a big thing to keep in mind there. Yeah, Donna? Well, here's two quotes that have really held true in my life. Um, you never know how strong you are until strong is the only choice you have. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other one is God doesn't give us a grace or something ahead of time. No. Yeah, it gives it to you in the moment. When, when we when we pray that I don't know that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, mm -hmm. what kind of bread do we pray for? Daily, daily. You know, for daily. for most of us Americans, that means I want enough food in my fridge for the next month, right? right. No. Or, or I guess that's the pantry. The fridge is for the next week, yeah. right? Uh, but it was a day to day thing, you know, for them. So and, and it's trusting day to day, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't the retarded be treated the same as us? God treats us based on our ability or on what we know and our ability to process it. Okay? So Kevin is responding differently than I would because he doesn't have the he doesn't have the ability to understand what we're talking about here. But you said he's really smart. For he's very smart for a kid in his and I call him a kid and he's what sixty yeah but yeah. <laughs> for, for what for this for the mental capabilities he has like he's he's intuitive in that if you give him a gift he'll immediately tell you thank you mm -hmm. he's intuitive in that if you have <clears throat> a mother sister brother um, that you have told him that is ill the next time he sees you he's going to ask, ask. you right how that person is mm -hmm. can he balance his checkbook pay his bills no he he can't right. can he understand algebra no can he add can any of us can he can he add two plus two to be four yes he, he can um so that that's I don't even kind try. of the level he's at. So, so it's kind of like a, uh, this is a Matthew 11. Then Jesus began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. He says, woe to you, Christ, and woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done and you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. And so it kind of gets back to the point of, you know, when you think about God's judgment, we're not judged on things we have no ability to comprehend or know. But we are judged on what we do know. And, and God, in his just judgment, he knows what opportunities we're given. We know what we can comprehend. He knows what we can't comprehend. He knows, you know, uh, and, and God can filter through all of those details. Yep. So he won't go to heaven if he doesn't understand? No, he will. But it, again, right. think of all the aborted babies, okay? Right. Um, they never had an opportunity nope. yeah. to understand it. it, it my wife and I lost pregnancy. I expect to see that baby in heaven. Which, which many have extended to the same with mental retardation, exactly. right? Exactly. If, if they don't have the comprehension right. ability to understand their need for Jesus. We all get hung up on the age of accountability. Okay. Kevin has never reached that age. He has never reached the age 
of accountability mentally. And I would argue that the age of accountability is older than what many of us say it is. Uh, especially when you go back and look at, at ages that were counted in the census and then other things in the Old Testament. But the important thing to remember is those that are exposed to Christ, those that have been told about him, they have been given greater knowledge than those that have it. And that, that's what worries me about those within my family and those that are my friends that have been exposed to that and are still rejecting it. Because I can't tell you about the about a Dinka tribesman, but I can tell you about a lot of my friends and where I feel they are, and it worries me. Well, there's this one king that well, he used to come to the Evergreen Place, and he knew everything. He knew every like sentence in the Bible. He could tell you what it was, and you know he'd remember your name, and you know it was just it was just pleasing, you know, to hear that from him. But he's retarded too. But he, you know. The, the one thing we can say is God won't do anything less than what's just. Exactly. But he does far more than what's fair. Incidentally, that might just be the principal line in the sermon. <laughs> wow. So, like, who you're talking about, Ellen and my cousin Kevin. Kevin can remember facts. <clears throat> He is almost an idiot savant when it comes to stats about the St. Louis Cardinals. <laughs> but remembering facts oh. and apply, being able to understand them and apply, apply it like physics. Can, if you study physics, physics is not about learning facts necessarily. Right. It, it, it's, or medical diagnosis, you know. I can have a fever and a sore throat to a doctor who who knows more can say, hey, that's a viral infection or that strep throat. One needs antibiotic, one doesn't. Kevin can't can't <clears throat> make distinguishing um, conclusions that are gray areas, but he can if it's black and white. And I think that's the way with your friend that understood the Bible. He understood a lot of the facts of the Bible, but can't apply it to gray areas. So simple terms. So yes. Like, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Does that make more sense? Of a childlike. Yes, a childlike. And there's nothing wrong with a childlike mm -hmm. faith. Oh. Did you ever see the movie Rain Man? Yes. 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 Okay, yes. the guy that no, Dustin no, Hoffman no. is based off of is a real life savant. Yeah. yeah. And sure. any day from a certain date forward in his life, where he's at, if you ask him what the weather was, he can tell you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he can tell you to an incredible precision. And I saw him on 60 Minutes 50 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. And it was just incredible. And there was another one um, where he could play the piano. Anything he heard, he could he could yeah. play it. Yeah. And they found a piece of classical music that hardly anyone has ever recorded. In fact, in fact, I think they had somebody specifically record it. They played him like three or four measures of it. And he played it perfectly from when they started the tape to when they ended the tape. Wow. How do you explain that? I don't. But again, the God of the universe is going to do what is right. And... <laughs> That, I think that is part of our Christian faith, is knowing when I come up short, he's going to stand in and cover me with his blood. Because trust me, you don't want me arguing your case before God. You want him. Yeah, I don't want to argue my case before God. Either. I don't want you arguing. You know, my case argument for my case is I accepted Jesus yeah. and I submit yeah. to him. Yeah. Uh, an observation. You, every so often in life, you run into this person. Well, I hear what you got to say about Jesus. I hear what the Bible tells you about Jesus, but it's too simple. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. When, that's yeah. what I thought. No, I I, that's gospel. where I heard it from. That's originally. what I thought when I heard the gospel. <laughs> this is too simple. You can't go to heaven 
access it seemed to you know what most of the world is programmed to think about works yep uh, yeah what you need it, it is what sets christianity so it's apart. hard to switch your thinking when you hear the gospel yeah yeah because it uh and, and incidentally, this does play into today's sermon. Oh, I, I, I didn't plan it that way. You, you guys, you guys are, you guys are. Oh, that quote was yours. Heading there. That <laughs> quote was yours. Uh, but, but you know, if, if, if and I've said this before, if we could work our way into heaven, then the death of Christ is unnecessary. Yep. Right. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. And and what he, God does through the death of Jesus is He's able to do what's just because sin is being dealt with. And he's able to do what's not fair for us, give us what we don't deserve. Yep. Right? Because there's nothing fair about the fact that Jesus had to die for us. But it is just that God is dealing with the problem of sin in order that he might give us his righteousness. Yeah. And, it's, and it's also important to understand that the law was not given to the Jews as a form of salvation. The law was given to them for them to be a peculiar people, to be separate from the world, so that the seed could come through them. That's it. In, I mean, in, in its most basic form, that's it. And Jesus fulfilled it. And why did Jesus fulfill it? Because he was the Messiah. Yeah. Forecast all the way back to Genesis. Yep. Absolutely. Imagine this, Rich. If they were um, obedient or, to... If they were oh, obedient... Yeah. Okay. If they were obedient to the law, like, at least with some of the stuff, and you mentioned the Jubilee and uh, the Sabbath day, and yeah. the uh, seven year sabbatical year, the people on the outside would see this, yep. and they're going to wonder about these people. Yep. And it would be, and when Christ finally did, did come, I think you'd have multitudes of people coming in from all nations. Yeah. If they saw the faith of the Israelites, if they were obedient to that point. But nonetheless, God still kept his promise the Messiah came to the Jews. Yep. <laughs> yep. Which is what he promised. Yep. Yeah. Now, Ecclesiastes tells us that there's nothing new under the sun, right? Yep. So let's look at how the imagery of verses one through three is reflective in what we see in Ezekiel 9. Once again, kind of seeing some parallels, right? So Ezekiel 9. Uh, yes. It's only a verse, it's only 11 verses, so it's not too bad. All right. Then I heard him call out in a loud voice Bring near those who are appointed to execute judgment on the city, each with a weapon in his hand. And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man clothed in linen who, was, who had a writing kit on his side. They came in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim, where it had been, and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all detestable things that are done in it. As I listened, he said to the others, Follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter the old men the young men and women, the mothers and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the old men who were in front of the temple. Then he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go. So they went out and began killing throughout the city. While they were killing and I was left alone, I fell face down, crying out, Alas, sovereign Lord, are you going to destroy the entire remnant of Israel in this outpouring of your wrath of Jerusalem? He answered me, The sin of the people of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed and the city is full of injustice. They say, the Lord has forsaken the land. The Lord does not see. 
So I will not look on them with pity or spare them, but I will bring down on their own heads what they have done. Then the man in the linen with the writing kit on his side brought back words saying, I have done as you can see. All right. So what, uh, what kind of parallels do you see between what's going on in Ezekiel and what's going on in Revelation? Mark. The mark. The seal are spared. Judgment's coming, right? Remember chapter six, kings, slaves, free everyone, except for we come to chapter seven, the sealed. Kill everyone except for the ones who have the mark, okay? What other contrast do you see? What's the difference between those who receive the mark and those who don't? We be destroyed. Where their allegiance lies. Yeah, I didn't know that was a really open-ended question. Yeah. Well, well <laughs> but, but I mean, so, so we're seeing the contrast between those who, who uh, worship God and those who are given to idolatry, right. which is the big theme in Revelation, right? In Revelation, it's, are we aligned with the lamb or are we aligned with the beast? And that's where the contrast is going to come up. So we kind of see this the same imagery that's being reflected in Revelation as, as back in, in uh, Ezekiel. You know, where where does our allegiance lie? Is it is it with idolatry or is it with God? And the picture is, is there's judgment coming uh, on anyone who doesn't have the mark. And where does God in Ezekiel start his judgment? From the sanctuary. Exactly. And this kind of goes back to the other conversation, right? To those who have the most, the most they're the most accountable. Where does Paul say, you know, we need to start cleansing and holding people accountable to the faith of Christ? The household of God. The household of God first. This is this is a verse that everybody could take comfort in. Judgment begins with the household of God. Yep. Now we need to understand that there's a difference between judgment and salvation and judgment in terms of discipline or rewards and so on and so yep. forth, right? And what did we learn from Ian Stanley? Judge the believer, not the heathen. Judge the believer, not the heathen. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh so that brief, you look like you have something to say. No? It's just about there. She's got a lot of say. <laughs> she has time to say it. You got till 1030. No, I just, I was just curious if there was any significance to the writers. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good answer. Yeah, well, it's in the Bible. It's, oh, it's relevant. It's, well, what's, what's he doing with the writer's case? He's writing <laughs> down those who are sealed. It's, right. it's. It's a representation of the uh, of the uh, book of life. Okay. Um, He's making notes, right? Yeah. So I didn't know he knew who it was. If there was any significant. <laughs> well, you that's know, a, that's a good point because when, when we studied this originally, there were those that said it's a reference, and there was others that said he was putting the names in. Now I tend to think that um, he's. Putting the names in because it's in in the Hebrew, it's a writing case. No. If it was a scroll, I would say he's referencing. Yeah. Mine says writer's case. Yeah. Um, real, Which kind of leads into the marking. I was going to say, what's interesting here is um, going back to the mark idea. We know in Ezekiel, he's talking about the judgment of Jerusalem the first time, and there's a mark. So the so what I'm saying is that this idea of a mark is obviously a common thing and how he marks his people or seals his people. Uh, yeah, that's the, that's the Old Testament well, people background. Make a big deal about them. And, and it's also point. the picture of a remnant from. Yeah. So you have a remnant from that are being saved. Right. Yeah. Okay, I have another question. So all these 90s end times movies are coming into my head. There's so many, so many that, that tackle this particular thing. Um, but I find it interesting that a lot of the references, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, refer to a seal on the forehead, whereas the Israelites, historically, that has not been the place where they have been marked for God. So is there a significance to that change in location? Well, if you look at the mark of the beast, you have the forehead and you have the, the hand, mm -hmm. right? Because it's a thought about what, how we think and what we do, uh, but you do get with the phylacteries and stuff, the forehead and the hand and stuff. So you get the markings on 
the priest. Yeah, so we're not talking circumcision, if that's what you mean by other places and being Martha, right? Well, I mean, that was that was but what they identified themselves with. As, yes, as but, but if you look at the Shema, it deals with the forehead and it deals with the hand. And the, uh, the other point to that is, if you also notice, um, you know, God's a feminist because he's telling them, mark the men and the women. And the other point with the forehead, as opposed to <clears throat> Islam, <clears throat> is women were allowed to show their face. Oh. And by seeing the face, you can tell at a glance if they're marked or not. And that's something that is really, and I don't mean this as a parody, passed over <laughs> when reading this. Because as circumcision is a sign of, of the covenant with Abraham, salvation is for all who are willing to accept it. And this is something to me that gets that that doesn't get enough visibility in the scripture. Is he saying everyone? men, women, whatever, Jew, Gentile, you're going to be marked. And that that should give great, not only great solace, but great joy. Because he's bringing the nations back. And, and that's the beauty between the first part of Revelation 7 and the second yes. part of Revelation 7. We move from the tribes to the nations right. of every tribe and nation and language. Yeah, absolutely. So it's this picture of and it's the same thing that the Old Testament talked about when, when all the nations will come and worship God, uh, and not just Israel, but all the peoples. I mean, all you have to do is read through Acts, and Paul is constantly saying in Acts, you know, the nations were separated and now God's bringing them back. Well, why is Paul saying this? Because he's the missionary to the Gentiles. And you, and you gotta love God. He's sending the Jews, 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 Jew out to the Gentiles. Irony is, yeah. 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 Any other questions or thoughts before we close up? And we'll we'll start with the hundred and forty-four thousand next week because you know we know there's no debate over that. Right. <laughs> That's a solid number. Good to seventy-two decimal. Yeah. There you go. Well, it's yeah. divisible by twelve. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Any other thoughts, questions, really comments? <laughs> All right. Well, we will pick up with the, the 144,000 next week then. Anybody want to close us with prayer? I'd be glad to. Yeah. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you and Father, we are thankful that we are allowed to look at your word positively instead of negatively. We thank you for knowing that we are sealed in Christ and that there is a joy in that, there is an assurance in that, and there is a blessing in that. And Father, we thank you for the sealing, not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done for your son. We thank you for this word. We thank you for this study. We thank you for the time dance put into it. But we also thank you for the questions that come from the group because we all want to understand. Father, thank you for not only your word and not only the spirit, but also the gift of your son that assures our sealing. I ask your spirit upon network today, upon Amanda's worship and upon Dan's message. And I ask that your spirit go out with us in the week to come. Again, Father, I praise you and thank you for the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus, the name above all names, in whose name we all pray. All God's children said, Amen. Amen. Amen.